Hello everyone and welcome back to the 48th annual Sun and Fun International Expo here at the Lakeland Linder International Airport. I'm Ben Coleman, your anchor host for the Florida Aviation Network, coming to you live and in the clear from the Central Florida Aerospace Academy here. And uh, thank you, Mr. James C. Ray. Uh, he's the benefactor that really made this high school uh, come to fruition here on the Sun and Fun campus. Florida Aviation Network, we're here, and we're run by all volunteer staff. Nobody gets a paycheck uh, out of this. And, uh, but our paycheck actually, I, I, that's wrong, I shouldn't say that. We do get a paycheck. Our paycheck is when somebody comes back and thanks us for hearing something or learning something about aviation safety that they hadn't heard before. And today's not gonna be any exception. This is gonna be another one of those things that there's, uh, we, we have guests of all variety here. Right now we have a, a gentleman that's been with, uh, in the industry for a pretty long time, knows a little bit about aviation, but we're gonna learn everything he knows about aviation today. Uh, Dr. Bush, Dr. Bush, welcome. It's this a pleasure. Dr. Bush, I gotta admit, this is not the first time we have met and I've always been uh, privileged to uh, get glean some of your information because uh, you keep your eye, uh, eye on the ball and your finger on the pulse of what's going on in aviation, primary, primarily the, the medical situation. You are a doctor and uh, that being said, when you match a, a doctor and the professionalism of that industry with Stallion 51, it's, uh, it comes up with a real, real good mix. Thanks for everything that you do. And uh, what is your primary role, Doc Bush, with uh, Stang 51, Crazy Horse? <clears throat> well, my primary role at this point in my career is basically to conduct a, an aviation medicine practice with an ophthalmology twist, which I'm board certified in ophthalmology. Uh, we examine patients uh, that are aviators or aviation interested people that want to go to flight training, take care of a lot of airline pilots, a lot of professional pilots, uh, and so we, I have a basic practice that does that, uh, but what we sort of specialize in where my office is, which is called AVDOC 51 at the Kissimmee Gateway uh, Airport, is uh, we solve problems. That's basically my specialty. Uh, now that I've evolved and I'm kind of old and ready to just seasoned. focus in on one thing. But so we Se seasoned. Dr. Seasoned, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> we solve problems, aviation medicine problems, problems that pilots have that can be across the board from physiologic, uh, pathologic, mental health, addictions, we solve those problems. And a lot of the uh, AMEs in Central Florida and even throughout Florida, they send their problem patients to us. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what we do, we solve problems for the pilots. That's, and uh, I, I know that there's a lot of uh, really, really sad stories out there, folks that have some problems. And, and, and unfortunately, it's probably your role also to let them know that, hey, you're not gonna, you don't need a medical. You, you're not gonna be well, safe for flight. They don't need one or they can't get one. Can't get one, probably. There's some of that, yes, but I would say most of the time, working with the FAA, as big of a bureaucracy and as difficult it is to work through those multiple layers, they're pretty reasonable on coming through eventually. Mm -hmm. It's all about having the motivation to stay with it mm -hmm. and keep d maneuvering under that profile, the FAA mm -hmm. profile, mm -hmm. to do what they want to get that uh, special issuance or waiver for your condition. Well, and there's probably very few other than like uh, diabetes or something that would render you uh, to become incapacitated during flight. That's the, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a frog here, but <clears throat> the FAA doctors are charged with maintaining safety in the airways pertaining to, med to medicine, medically mm -hmm. wise. Mm -hmm. And they're very concerned about sudden incapacitation. So if you've got an issue that could result in sudden incapacitation, yes, that's of high interest to them. Anything else, like you sprained your knee when you're in grade school, had a toe surgery or whatever, they're not interested in that. But when it comes to uh, uh, cardiovascular, neurological, some systemic diseases, very concerned about sudden incapacitation. Hmm. That's what it's all about. Uh, self-certification, and a lot of folks say, what do you mean self -cert We can't self-certify ourselves. And I said, stop and think about it. You may have a, uh, an airman's medical that says that you're fit to fly on this day, but after a while, after a couple months, like you say, you hurt yourself, you, you sprain your knee, you go through a surgery of some sort, you can't, you have to pull yourself down 
and make the determination that, okay, I'm, I'm fit for flight. So kind of a self-assessment, if you will. Can you help me? That's, that's part of being a, an aviator, a pilot, is to self-assess yourself and whether you're fit to fly. Uh, there are rules and regulations, there's uh, certifications and limitations, but it's all about the individual aviator and they teach you that in flight school. They certainly teach you that in military flight school. Are you safe to fly that day, mentally and physically? Mm -hmm. And that's what you're talking about. Oh yeah. If you've had a surgery or have a new medical diagnosis of some sort, you sort of have to judge on your own whether you're safe to fly, but not really. You can call your AME or you can just call an AME and ask him. Mm -hmm. And I have pilots call me all the time. Uh, they had a, a situation of a cold or a COVID or whatever, and they got this medicine. Can they still fly? Well, most of the time you can. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can't. Sometimes you have to wait for a period of time until the medicine is gone out of your system. Well, a lot of people, they, uh, I don't think they realize just how uh, some of this medication makes them fuzzy. Uh, right. A little bit slow down reaction time. Over-the-counter medicines, there's a lot of over-the-counter medicines out there that can cause a pilot uh, I would say limitations in performance. Uh, antihistamines come to mind, uh, certain antidiarrheals come to mind, stuff like that, and you can find a list of those things that are not recommended for flying or prohibited from flying on an FAA website. Uh, AOPA can comment on that, your AME can comment on that. Uh, you can call the FAA themselves if you can get a hold of somebody to talk to and they'll comment on mm. it. Doc Bush. Tell me what you guys do uh, there at Stallion 51 when you do have a student or a, a customer that comes in and wants to get their, their rating or get checked out uh, in, in a P-51. Do they come to you at some point in time and say, uh, Doc, will you take a look at this person that I, I'm not too sure we might not have a good candidate here? Well, we have people come in the Stallion 51 to fly the P-51 and occasionally the L-39 jet. and. Uh, Generally, they come just for an orientation flight, which even under that, those conditions, they will fill out a medical questionnaire. And if they check something, yes, that's of interest, then they will be interviewed by me. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that's most of the people that come for regular uh, general orientation flights don't check yes, and they don't see me. But when they do check yes, they've had a surgery, they've had a condition, they've got a disease, then I will go interview them and give them a thumbs up, and it's almost always that way because mm -hmm. they also have to bring a letter from their treating physician saying they can fly in the airplanes. Mm -hmm. So it's a double double uh, check there. That works out. Uh, on the other hand, we have others that come to Stallion 51 for the full checkout, which may be many hours of flight instruction because they're going to fly a P-51 by themselves or actually own a P-51. Mm -hmm. They'll come for an extended course, and some of the times, if they don't have much prior flight experience, I will give them a brief on the G-lock situation and maybe altitude physiology and stuff like that. And uh, does that, I mean, how do, how do I say this? Does it happen? I mean, as far as how many does Gs, do they get G-lock? I mean, did they, uh, anybody come out with <coughs> well, a gray I mean, out or get a, I think, it's, is that the term, gray out? You can gray out, uh, you know, you can G-lock. I mean, G is the force of gravity. Right now, we're under one G, right? Mm -hmm. If you accelerate against the force of gravity, like we're in an airplane that's pitching up or turning, that acceleration against the wings and the gravity will cause more G's to be built up on you. And anybody that's seen Top Gun knows this, right? <laughs> so generally speaking, flying conservatively in the P-51, they may pull three G's, but when they're not out there pulling nine G's, okay, that's mm -hmm. a military thing. But they need to be briefed on it in case, they need to be briefed on it and how they will resist those G's, what kind of maneuvers, what mm -hmm. kind of grunting and, and, and uh, physiological maneuvers you do to keep the brain up in the top half of your body, mm -hmm. specifically in the brain area. <laughs> that's preferable. Yes, I mean the Mustang can G-lock you, but uh, again, it's the pilot that's doing it to himself, so. Mm. Okay. Talk to me a little bit about vision. <clears throat> you know a thing or two about vision in AVM. <laughs> uh, More than most people that work at Walmart, yes. <laughs> You're an expert. Uh, presbyopia. I am just fascinated with that because uh, I may be a freak of nature because I don't require reading glasses. Well, let me ask you this. How old are your eyes? 66. And you don't wear reading glasses? No, sir. Do you wear distance glasses? No, sir. Impressive. Good genes. What's your secret? I have no idea. It's just, uh, it's, it, but, but I'm concerned about how uh, the folks that do have that, is reading glasses, is that the only? But with that condition, you don't need any glasses for distance or near? 
No, but my my uh, I think my wife, unfortunately, she she's got she needs reading glasses for everything. Have it, you ever thought about a career in the carnival world? <laughs> I don't have enough hair. Okay, so uh, I mean that's unusual. Usually, right. people in their forties they start getting presbyopia, which means their near vision starts marching out, and when they get to the end of their arm, they go, "I can't read anymore." So then they get reading glasses. That's generally how it happens. And that's pretty common, I Very guess, common. for uh, Very predictable. For years. By what age they are, you can almost predict what their correction is going to be, what power of glasses. Interesting. Uh, and there's no surgery or anything for, uh, that's the hardening of the lenses, I guess. It's, it's the focus. There's some theories, which, I mean, I could go into those, but the point is it's very common, and there is surgery that can fix it. But at that age, if you only... If you have presbyopia and you want that fixed surgically, like with a laser surgery, you're going to be giving up your distance vision. It's Rob not so. It's not Rob so Peter much Peter that you're getting, mm -hmm. right. Well, it's not so much that you're losing your near vision. Mm -hmm. What you're losing is the ability to have both distance and near at the same time. Some people can read till they're 90 without glasses, because they're nearsighted at distance. They're myopic. Yeah. You see, you mm -hmm. only get one, one thing when you get older. Usually speaking. How about doing one eye and not the other eye? Well, that really messes. That's up. called monovision. That's yeah. called monovision, and people have done that. Uh, it seems to run uh, uh, popular amongst movie stars and politicians hmm. because now they're not seen wearing reading glasses. So even though the politician's 70 years old, he doesn't wear reading glasses because he has one eye for near and one for distance. Monovision, because yeah. he doesn't want to look old wearing reading glasses. Well, the, everybody knows if you wear reading glasses, you're not a spring chicken. Oh, I, the, pretty well, funny, I, huh? I'm going to have to get some reading glasses just just because I can fit in. I don't <laughs> feel like I fit in, but uh, and I would think that the monovision would it give you a headache. Well, you have I to mean, get used to goodness. it, and that's why monovision is not authorized for aviation. I, I see. I wasn't monovision aware of that. is not authorized for flying an aircraft. So if you had a surgery where you have one eye fixed at distance and one eye fixed at near then you have to wear corrective lenses to make sure they're both lined up. Mm. It also can influence your depth of, of perception, mm. okay, with the monovision. How about sodas? Do you get involved with sodas? The Statement well, of disability? Not the, no, okay, I'm joking. <laughs> statement of, <laughs> statement of you, demonstrated you ability. Yeah. Uh, that is called a soda. It's performed at the FISDO level. It's performed for conditions that are not expected to change. Mm -hmm. They're permanent conditions, like you're monocular, which means you have one eye, mm -hmm. or you have a limb problem, you can't do something, or you have certain diseases. Or it's, it's, a, it's checked out by the FAA that you can perform your aviation duties as a pilot with this condition that's not mm -hmm. expected to change. Mm -hmm. You've had an amputation, for instance. That's called a sto statement of demonstrated ability. And uh, once you get it, it's considered permanent. And uh, is it something that you have to apply for every time? No, it's or considered it permanent. One, it's, it's a one-time one time. thing. Right, one time Unless thing. something changes. Unless something changes, but there are conditions that are expected not to change. You don't get sodas for, you know, diabetes, heart disease, that sort of stuff. You get mm -hmm. it for certain surgeries, amputations, you're missing mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Doc, what, what else goes on at Stallion 51 that involves uh, a medical aspect of where you would get involved, other than just when they check off from their medical well, we have questionnaire. Well, we have an unusual attitude training program there called UAT, and uh, I teach a class that's about 90 to one, an hour and a half to two hours long about aviation physiology pertaining to spatial disorientation. Hmm. And it's uh, on the physiologic level, and it's, you know, it's a pretty long brief. Uh, it's pretty interesting for me, uh, but, you know, it's sort of an abbreviated addition to what you would get if you were on active duty military flight mm -hmm. training. Do you guys have a vertigo chair, or do you have any type of a... Uh, you know, we thought about that, but our UAT program, by design, is taken by mature, experienced aviators. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not private pilot training. The average customer we have for that training program is a commercial pilot for a corporation, mm -hmm. or we do a lot of Army active duty people, too, mm -hmm. because the Army is mostly helicopters, right? And when they transition to the fixed wing thing, they've been coming to us for their uh, unusual attitude training. But they're all experienced aviators, so we don't really do the chair thing, you know, the spin and puke chair. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> no, no, it will. And, you know, a lot of the people that come are also prepared in that category, especially the military guys. They've already been taught this stuff, so they pretty much could teach it themselves. The, uh, the L-39 <clears throat> that you guys use for your uh, upset training, how... What altitudes do you typically go to in that airplane to practice? What the airplane can go to, or what do they go use to what, what, train? What do y'all use? It's the mid teens, the mid teens. Okay, so you're 12, still 14, and, and you're on oxygen. 
No, it's pressurized. It's all pressurized. So what happens in the event of a depressurization, rapid? Well, of course, they descend quickly, but right. I'm going to the altitude chamber. That, that's, do you ever send you anybody? You are going to the altitude chamber. That's where I'm going to in our discussion here. Oh, okay. Where do we, when do we go and get somebody to take a, a physiological altitude chamber ride, if you will? Uh, that's sort of a different category than spatial disorientation. Spatial okay. disorientation is uh, instruments and how you're flying them, and part of our training is you're flying the jet under the back, under the bag underneath, so all the pilot has to look at is the flight instruments. And then he's put in at certain positions, like mm -hmm. nose high, airspeed slow, nose low, airspeed high, and these various unusual attitude positions that he could find himself mm -hmm. in at night or in instrument conditions, or if he got in the turbulence of an airliner or something and was flipped upside down, that's what all that's about. Mm. Uh, we brief a little bit on the altitude stuff, but we don't have an altitude chamber, and that's not really the that's really not the description of our program. You want to spend more time on the actual upset and how to recover right. from this. I mean, the, 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 the program is two days long. It's a lot of lectures, and it's two flights. Uh, one is VFR, unusual attitudes, and how they relate to also some aerobatic maneuvers. Mm -hmm. And then the second flight is under a bag that covers the canopy, so basically the pilot is flying in a white cloud. Mm. Can't see outside. And it's all videoed from the pilot's perspective, from the aircraft's perspective, and from the instrument perspective, and it's debriefed. Mm. It's a big thing in military training. Mm -hmm. It's huge. In fact, uh, when I was in training in the military to fly, uh, the first 15 or so flights in both the T-2 Buckeye jet and the A-4 Skyhawk jet, Hawk jet were all instruments. This is before we even had a familiarization flight. You're sitting in the back and you're taking off under the bag without seeing as a student. You're, you're rotating on the runway, taking off and flying all these missions solely on instruments. So it's all about mm -hmm. instrument training. Mm -hmm. And in the civilian world, you don't get that, except you get that in the simulators only. This is mm -hmm. real world. You're in a jet. It's a jet fighter type trainer. Mm -hmm. It pulls a lot of Gs. It goes straight up, straight down. It's the L-39. It's based on military flight training, only it's an abbreviated course because these guys ought to get anywhere from five to ten to twenty thousand hours. Wow, and I, I see a passion. You mentioned the A four. Yeah. Uh, you're passionate about that airplane. You got some time in them. Well, I trained in it. Yeah. Okay. Good. You know, you don't see that many A fours anymore. Uh, well, they were a '50s design. I think his name was Ed Heineman or Al Heineman. He designed it for McDonnell Douglas, and it was a great aircraft. Lasted on active duty with the Navy for at least. 30 for years plus. Mm. In fact, I still think they fly them as, aggr and as aggressors. It's the small plane in the Top Gun movie, mm -hmm. not the F-14, the other small one. That's the A-4. Wow. Well, Doc, where are we going with this? Uh, do you get involved with basic med much, or do people ask you questions? Or Lots of questions. In fact, that's why I'm a little bit hoarse. I just got done talking for two straight hours almost. And so uh, uh, basic med is a, is a topic. It's uh, sort of a topic that was the whole thing was sort of a little bit forced on the FAA. I'm not sure if they liked it or not, but they did acknowledge it. Basic Med is like a subcategory of class three. You know, there's classes one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Class one, medical examina or medical certification is for airline pilot captains. Class two is for commercial pilots, and class three is for everybody else. Basic Med is like a subcategory of class three. There's limitations. Uh, let's see if I can conjure them up. Uh, you have to have had a medical since, I think, June 15th, 2006. Hmm. You have to be, have a U.S. driver's license. You have to be examined by your family practice doctor, and uh, he has to pass you. You have to take a course online. You have to fly an aircraft that has six or less seats. You have to fly an airplane below 250 knots, below 18,000 feet. You can't fly it for commercial purposes, and it's got to be in the continental U.S. only. So just put some limitations on your on your Limitations. Med. Now, most AMEs do not do basic med. Hmm. Most AMEs do not do basic med. They do classes one, two, and three. Basic med is supposed to be performed medical part, the medical part, by your family practice doctor hmm. who knows you. And they sign off that they think you're fit to fly. Interesting, because I've, I've never really dealt with basic med, but uh, I've had a few questions about it, but I didn't know exactly uh, how to answer it. I just send them to the website. Go to, go to the internet. They've got all the requirements. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a whole, there's a little bit of a class uh, you can take on it. It's got a, hold on a second. Well, you're a doctor, and you you yeah, get calls all the time. I, I actually do, yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. 
Okay, so that's basic med. It's a good thing. Uh, you know, if it fits your needs for flying and your aircraft fits that needs, then go for it. Yeah. And uh, it's and again, we, uh, we're talking about medical situation, the ultralight world. <laughs> it's just, you got a driver's license, yeah, go. Well, I mean, not all countries follow that. I mean, I've got, now, for flying balloons, flying ultralights, not ultralights, uh, light sports. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., you don't need a medical for that. In other countries, you do. I see pilots that come to me that are balloon pilots, but they want to spend their, their summers flying balloons in Canada. And in Canada, you have to have a class three. And then I have skydivers. Skydivers are coming to me. Skydivers don't need a medical as far as skydiving in the U.S. However, the United States Parachute Association says that if the skydiver is a tandem jumper, mm -hmm. he has to have a class three medical, you see. You know what's interesting? I've had folks ask me, so Ben, you used to be with the FAA. You, you know all this medical stuff. And I said, mm, not necessarily. But yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about getting a light sport because I, I don't think I could pass a, a third class medical. And I don't want to go basic Just because med. you have pres or don't have presbyopia? <laughs> okay, go ahead. No, but I, but the, the funny thing is, is they think that they're going to get away with something. I don't think I'd be able to pass a medical. I hadn't been feeling good here recently. You don't need to be flying. If you don't feel well, good, Well, if you don't feel don't good, fly. you don't fly that day. But I'm yeah. assuming you're not going to feel good or feel bad every day. If you're in doubt or you, if you think you know what you're doing and you're not an AME, why don't you call an AME and ask him? I just it just slays me about folks trying to skirt the issue rather than just deal directly with what's going on. But you know, I, I think that uh, we're going to start winding this down, and I feel the need for some hops and barley <laughs> going down my, this throat passage here. Uh, come join you us look for like a beer. A, you look like a man of thirst. Yes, sir. I'm thirsty right now today. <laughs> Doc, thanks it's so much pleasure. for spending a little bit of time here with us, and uh, we're going to sign this one off. Another 48th annual Center Fund. National Aviation Safety Foundation, Florida Aviation Network. Ben Coleman, your host. We'll see you in the next interview.